and to give us more details in terms of what of course has unfolded today and also what India of course is aiming for. We're being joined by Dr. Ajay Lele, who's a senior fellow at the Manohar Parker Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. He's joining us live on this broadcast. Now, Dr. Lele, this is a significant moment in India's quest to become a nation that can actually soft land on the surface of the moon. Now, for people who are watching this who do not understand what a soft landing means, you know, give us a sense of what actually entails in a soft landing on the moon and why is it so crucial? Uh, as far as soft landing on the moon is concerned, India tried its luck in the year 2019 with a mission called Chandrayaan-2. That mission had two objectives. One was to put a orbiter into the close vicinity of the moon, that is in the lunar orbit. And other aspect was to do a soft landing on the moon. Soft landing means you send a equipment, a robotic equipment, uh, on the moon surface, make it land on the moon surface and take another equipment out of the belly of that equipment. So the mother equipment is known as a lander. Right. So that equipment lands on the moon surface and the rover equipment gets out of the mother equipment and starts operating on the moon surface. As a pre-programmed equipment, it starts moving on the moon surface and starts picking up observations. At places, it can go slightly 10, meter, 10 centimeters deep into the moon surface and also have a look at the soil on the moon surface. There are operations which are pre-planned. So there is a mineralogical mapping which happens. There's a chemical analysis which happens. And that rover sends the messages back to the lander. Right. And that lander sends the messages back to the orbiter and the messages are picked up on the Earth's ground station. Uh, so India failed to do that in the year 2019. Now India is re-attempting that. And in that direction, the first step successfully has taken place today when India has launched the Chandrayaan-3 missions. It will take another 40 to 42 days to get into the orbit of the moon and subsequently get deorbited and land onto the surface of the moon uh, as a single unit, a right. lander. And subsequently, the rover will get out of the belly of a lander and start undertaking observations. So it's not only lander or a rover, both the systems will start undertaking different types of observations. They have got different sensors on board, what we call as payloads. All right, indeed. Uh, now, Mr. Lele, uh, what is also interesting is that India is trying to land on the south pole of the moon. Uh, give us, tell us our viewers why it is important to land on the south pole of the moon. Why is it that this particular destination was chosen and not any other destination? Uh, as you were mentioning earlier, there are only three countries who have done the soft landing of the moon. So most of these soft landings on the moon have happened at the equatorial region. Uh, what happens on the surface of the moon is that you require solar energy basically to keep your systems operational. So equator is a place where you will have abundance amount of a solar energy continuously available. But as you start moving closer to the South Pole, uh, you see South Pole could be considered at 90 degrees at the uh, latitude of the equator, south of the equator. India is planning to launch uh, land around 70 degrees of latitude uh, towards the south. Right. Now the issue over here is that you require a sun rise also, uh, you require sun raises also. At the same time, you require certain areas where the sun is not going to reach. The reason behind this is that in the year 2008-2009, when India did its first mission to the moon, India has identified the presence of a water on the moon. Now, this presence of a water is in form of hydrogen molecules. Now, India wants to dig further deep over here. Now, since the temperatures on the moon are exorbitantly high in the morning period, uh -huh. hence there is no possibility of the water to stand there on the equatorial region or other region. The presence of water could be only there right. where there is a total shadow region. That means no sun rays are reaching over there. So these regions are close to the South Pole. There's uh -huh. a possibility that there could be a water available, not as a pure water what we you and me drink, but in form of a frozen ice or something. So that understanding is more importantly required since India has already done a testing and found out there is water available. So this one can say as a step two in that direction. And that's the reason India has decided to land onto the south pole of the moon, uh, closer to the south pole of the moon. Uh, it takes 
good amount of a technical expertise to do these types of activities Absolutely. also because you require more amount of a fuel to do such type of a landing. Uh, so India considers this mission not only as a technology demonstration mission, but a mission which has got both aspects. One is a technology demonstration and other is to look for scientific endeavors and undertake some scientific experimentation. Absolutely indeed, Dr. Lele. Do continue to stay on with us. Meanwhile, I'm told that we're also being joined by the former ISRO chairman, Dr. Madhavan Nair. He's joining us live from Trivandrum. Uh, Dr. Nair, this, this is a big moment for India, isn't it? We tried to soft land on the moon during the Chandrayaan-2 mission. We just very narrowly missed it. We were about 355 meters above the moon surface when, when we lost contact uh, with the Chandrayaan-2 moon mission, but now we are attempting to land on the moon again. You know, tell us what are the challenges that await for India and how is it that we would want to get things right this time around? Uh, well, I think uh, the last mission, uh, I will say that by and large it went uh, correctly up to two kilometers above the surface of the moon. At the time, uh, some anomaly in the control system has taken place. Uh, which has resulted in uh, a tumbling motion of the spacecraft, which lost its control and which was not able to effectively reduce the velocity to the low value of about less than two meter per second. Uh, it impacted with about, uh, uh, I understand, about 30 to 40 meter per second. With that velocity, the entire spacecraft would have disintegrated. Uh, the soft landing maneuver is a very complex uh, uh, operation where you know unlike in air uh once you break the earth's orbit the atmosphere comes to the rescue and with the atmospheric drag the velocity can be reduced considerably mm -hmm. and the ultimate final phase is uh, using parachutes one can have a soft touch down whereas on the moon there is no atmosphere right so this entire operation has to be done with the propulsion modules and, and they have to compensate for the uh, gravitational pull of the moon and then very uh, programmed manner it has to take it down right so at the end of four, uh, two kilometers they went into a fine control mode where virtually the spacecraft will be floating and it will be placed uh, very slowly on the surface of the moon Absolutely. so if either any sensor or the computer or its algorithm or the thrusters misbehave this kind of thing can happen uh -huh. uh, the data available was very meager. So Absolutely. it was not possible to pinpoint, uh, but at the same time, all possible modes of failure has been analyzed by ISRO. And they have taken action to strengthen all those elements which are found to be uh, deficient or weak. Uh, right. For example, the last gear is now stronger one. The mm -hmm. propulsion module is redesigned with a fine mode of control. Right. and the sectors are being provided with redundancy and the algorithm for the mission management also has been modified. After Absolutely. this, a large number of simulations have been carried out and uh, the, the confidence obtained uh, in those simulations, especially mm -hmm. uh, simulating the uh, non-nominal conditions Absolutely. in case some anomaly takes place, how the mission can be recovered. So all of this has been done and uh, hopefully that will lead to a uh, 100% success on 23rd of August. Absolutely indeed. And also, uh, Dr. Nair, you know, for the lay people who are watching this this incredible journey that Chandrayaan-3 is presently on now, you know, a lot of people think that the spacecraft takes off from the Earth, it travels straight up and then it goes to the moon. Uh, you know, for, for a lay person who is watching us, tell us how this journey actually takes place. Because this rocket will first go into an elliptical uh, orbit and then it goes into ever larger the, elliptical the orbits. The and then it goes to a in region the, the where the gravitational pull of the Earth no longer covers it. And then the gravitational pull of the Moon begins to attract this rocket system. Tell us in in simple way as to how this actually works out. Um, well, it is uh, like this. Uh, Earth's gravitational field is the one which keeps the spacecraft around the Earth. And, uh, you know, it is just like uh, uh, tying a stone and uh, rotating uh, at the end of the rope and then rotating it. So as long as the velocity is high, the rope will remain straight. Similarly, when we have the, the gravitational pull and the centrifugal force, which is coming out of the spacecraft balances, it stays there. 
So initially, what is done is using this uh, heavy lift launcher. Mm -hmm. It is placed into uh, 100 kilometers by 36,000 kilometer orbit. That right. means closest to Earth, it is around 200 kilometers, and farthest point is around 36,000 kilometers. So that is a very respectable number. But from there to, of course, one can take a slingshot directly to the moon. Right. But the uncertainties are uh, very great because once you leave the gravitational field of Earth, the influence of the moon, the Mars, and even sun becomes very predominant. And uh, this influence coefficients has to be able you know, basically, you know, the one that gets out of the Earth's gravitational field, uh, it will be subjected to the pull by the moon, the Mars, and uh, solar other planets in the solar system, as well as sun. So this uh, has to be calibrated. To what extent uh, the trajectory is deviated? And of course, there's a tracking station in the Bangalore, which will keep track of these movements. Mm -hmm. So what we, the propulsion modules fire uh, step by step, maybe oh. about five or six steps, and raise it to about uh, uh, 120,000 kilometers. And from there, give you the escape velocity to travel towards moon. There, the velocity direction and the uh, velocity magnitude are very critical. So then only it will reach the closer to the moon. As it approaches the moon, the velocity is sufficiently high, and uh, normally it will simply fly by. So right. uh, the precise moment, this propulsion module has to be operated again to reduce the velocity so that the moon can pull the entire spacecraft into its orbit. There again, initially it will be in elliptical orbit. Later, uh, using the propulsion modules step by step, it will be brought down to a 100 kilometer Absolutely. orbit. It stabilizes at 100 kilometer orbit. Uh, the operation for descent maneuver will be initiated. All right, very Once interesting. You you know, it's, it's for the common people who are watching this. You know, it's difficult to even wrap their heads around the the kind of difficult calculations that will have to be done to put the um, put put the rocket in the specific desired orbit so that it slowly reaches an area where it goes out of the Earth's gravitational field and then falls into the moon's gravitational field. But Dr. Lele, if I can bring you in on this, you know, the, the technical aspects of this entire mission are tremendous. Uh, the place where we are trying to land in the south pole of the moon, it is said that there are these craters on the south pole of the moon where sunlight has not reached in millions of years. And that is what makes these craters in the south pole of the moon so interesting and so important for us to land upon. Uh, definitely. Uh, you see, as far as the entire moon mineralogy, entire moon geography, everything has been mapped not only by Indian missions, but by the missions which have been sent by United States of America and few other countries also. So now there is a reasonable understanding about how the moon surface looks like, what are the heights of these mountains, what are the depths of the craters over there. Uh, so ISRO has undertaken all these sorts of available information. And remember, they have already an orbiter which is moving out over there. So orbiter is continuously sending the imageries. So based on all that sort of information, now ISRO had identified, has identified the exact landing zone for the on the moon, uh, where there will not be any issues associated either with high mountains or the craters also. So a lot amount of precaution has been taken already by understanding where exactly the, uh, the system should land. And more importantly, as the mission starts progressing more towards the moon, right. then another imagery will be picked up from the orbiter. Some sort of a calibration will be done, and then only finally the decision will be taken uh, in what on what landing zone the mission is to be landing. Absolutely, indeed. And uh, Mr. Dr. Nair, if I if I can give you the last word on this, you know, it's not just in India where more than a billion people are watching. It is pretty much anyone who's interested in space and in space travel across the world is, is watching at this Chandrayaan-3 mission. And one of the reasons as to why India's space missions stand out for is the economy with which India is able to carry out these space missions successfully. Comparisons have been made about, you know, how India's space missions have often been cheaper than the budget of a Hollywood movie. So the question, sir, that I want to ask you is, how does ISRO do it? 
Well, uh, it is a uh... It goes to the credit of uh, our founding father, like uh, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who has uh, really cultivated what is called the ISRO culture. This has been nurtured by people like Professor Davan, Dr. Kalam, Professor U. R. Rao, and so on. And today, we have got a very vibrant organization. Who, uh, they are very enthusiastic engineers, technicians, and others are there to take on the technology challenges, irrespective of the remuneration what they get. The remuneration what they, you pay to the ISRO team is maybe about one tenth of what uh, they may get in a, a similar job uh, in a, a developed country. That's one factor. Mm -hmm. The second thing is ISRO's careful planning and execution. So they have uh, ISRO has chalked out uh, normally about a ten-year plan right from the beginning and uh, various uh, elements of rockets, satellites. Uh, the application technology, etc., has been uh, being developed continuously. And this development process makes use of what is already developed technology maximally. Right. Only the new elements are being reduced. See, for example, the GSLV Mark III, which has gone up, has got the propulsion modules derived from the PSLV. Right. Absolutely indeed. Thank you very much indeed to Dr. Nair and also to Dr. Lele for joining us on this broadcast and sharing your insights in, in this very important and crucial story. We'll be watching this very, very closely indeed as India is, of course, embarking on a journey to script history to become only the fourth nation in the world to do a soft landing on the surface of the moon. Beyond is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.